This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 136, Bradley McGee, Part 1. In 1987, four-month-old Bradley McGee was abandoned at a shopping mall and placed into foster care. He spent most of his life thriving and happy in the Lakeland, Florida home of his foster family. In 1989, despite reports of abuse from multiple family members and others, Bradley was placed back into the custody of his mother and stepfather, Cheryl and Tom Coe. Just two months later, two-year-old Bradley was dead. This is the story of yet another toddler murdered over potty training when his stepfather punished him for having an accident by dunking his head repeatedly and viciously into the toilet bowl. It's also the story of a little boy whose death prompted sweeping changes in Florida's child welfare system. This is part one of the horrific story of Bradley McGee. First, I'd like to give a shout out to my newest patrons, Holly O. from Buell, Idaho, and Bev H. from Reefer Rick's Boathouse. Thank you both so much for your pledges. If you'd like to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash stlcpod or ko-fi.com slash stlcpod. I've had Bradley's case on my list for a while now, but going in, I had no idea how much detail I would find or that I'd be able to get in touch with anyone related to his story. In part two, you'll hear my conversation with Bradley's younger sister, who was only a year old when he died, but is nonetheless committed to keeping her big brother's memory alive. Now let's get into Bradley's story. Cheryl McGee was born on November 17, 1968. She grew up in Jerseyville, Illinois, where she later said that her mother abused her when she was a child. When Cheryl was 16, her mother, an alcoholic, died of cirrhosis of the liver, and Cheryl dropped out of Jerseyville Community High School. At age 17, Cheryl later said she was raped, but she never filed criminal charges. That event left Cheryl pregnant, and on June 6, 1987, 18-year-old Cheryl gave birth to Bradley Jean McGee. When Bradley was about a month old, Cheryl moved herself and her infant son to Lakeland, Florida to be closer to her stepbrother, Bill McGee. Cheryl later claimed her stepbrother first stole the small inheritance she received from her mom and then kicked her and Bradley out. In September of that year, while working at McDonald's in Lakeland, Cheryl met a man named Thomas Coe. Tom was born on March 1, 1967, with a congenital dislocated hip and hereditary kidney disease. He grew up in Iowa and later in Polk County, Florida. He joined the ROTC in high school but his physical issues prevented him from following his dream of joining the military. Tom's mother, Mary Coe, later described him as an angry young man, saying, His dream was to have a camp in the mountains where he could play war games. Tom did not have a home, and shortly after meeting him, Cheryl and her infant son moved into Tom's truck with him, which he parked at the Lakeland Mall on Memorial Boulevard. In October of 1987, an unknown individual reported this living arrangement to the Florida Child Abuse Registry. Cheryl and Tom were both out of work and money. Days after they were reported for living in Tom's truck, Cheryl approached Loretta Baker, a woman who worked at a pretzel stand at the mall. Loretta had noticed the family before. She had even given them food. When Cheryl said she was too poor to care for her baby and asked Loretta to take Bradley, who was wearing nothing but a wet diaper, Loretta later said, I couldn't say no. They had been living in a car with no clothes. 
I had a home with electricity. Bradley was clearly not feeling well, congested and wheezing. The next day, a friend of Loretta's took the sick baby to the hospital. The Florida Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services, or HRS, which would later become the Department of Children and Families, became involved. An HRS caseworker reached out to Cheryl's stepbrother, Bill, who told him Cheryl had been doing drugs and mooching off him. He claimed Cheryl didn't bathe the baby or take care of him, and that she fooled around with a lot of men. On top of that, he said, she'd known Thomas Coe for less than a month, and they were already engaged to be married. A Polk County juvenile court judge placed Bradley into state custody, and on October 23, 1987, the four-month-old was placed with his Uncle Bill. Unbelievably, with her son in state care, on October 29, 1987, Cheryl and Tom married. They soon moved into a mobile home together. Very quickly, Mr. and Mrs. Coe discovered they were expecting their first child together, a daughter they would name Rebecca or Becky. In February of 1988, a psychological assessment was performed on both Tom and Cheryl, finding that both of them were immature and explosive, and that they seemed to treat Bradley as a peer instead of an infant, as if he should be able to care for himself. It described Tom reacting to anger or stress with a rather infantile explosiveness. The report recommended that Bradley only be returned to them after extensive counseling and parenting classes, because otherwise he would be at risk of being neglected or inadequately supervised. It stated that they should demonstrate residential, employment, and marital stability before Bradley could be returned. In early 1988, Bill McGee told HRS that he was no longer able to care for his nephew. Court records from that time stated, Mother not present. Whereabouts unknown. Bradley was taken to a shelter home run by a woman named Sandra Kip Lyles, where he stayed for six weeks while child welfare workers searched for an appropriate foster home. Kip later said that it didn't take long before Bradley crawled right into her heart. He was such a happy little rascal. He was so needy, but he was so loving. I never had to really scold Bradley at all. He was just such a happy baby. Soon, Bradley was placed in the large, barn-shaped cedar home of Jim and Pam Kirkland in Lakeland. The couple had been state-licensed foster parents for about three years by that time, and they quickly grew to adore little Bradley. As he learned to speak, Bradley called Pam and Jim Mommy and Daddy. On September 20, 1988, at a hearing on Bradley's case, an HRS caseworker told the judge that because no one had heard from Cheryl, who had not once called HRS to ask about her son, her parental rights should be severed and Bradley should be put up for adoption. The Kirklands, by that time, had planned to adopt Bradley. The next day, however, Cheryl called HRS, saying she and her husband, Tom, wanted their son back home with them and his baby sister, Becky. As in countless stories I've told before, HRS had a policy to reunite families whenever possible. In too many cases, that bias toward reunification essentially signs a child's death warrant. By Florida law at the time, as soon as Cheryl expressed her desire to get her son back, his HRS caseworker, Margaret Barber, was required to make reunification her top priority and to create and implement a performance agreement for the COs with the court's approval. A performance agreement is basically a plan stating goals and tasks required to reunify a child with his biological parent. The initial performance agreement said that the COs must accomplish multiple goals and perform numerous tasks, including attending a parenting skills class, maintaining adequate housing, maintaining adequate income and employment, receiving psychological evaluation and treatment, and undergoing screening for alcohol or drug abuse and receiving treatment if necessary. Cheryl and Thomas took a parenting class and received a certificate of completion, even though they only attended about half of the sessions. They missed at least one scheduled counseling appointment. They started but failed to complete an alcohol and drug abuse program, in fact angrily ending their cooperation with the program. The two agency counselors wrote in a letter HRS gave to the judge, The Coes are both in need of intensive mental health counseling. They have failed to satisfactorily complete their treatment recommendations. After this, Ms. Barber and her supervisor recommended continued supervision for the couple, the use of a placement support program worker to teach the Coes in-home parenting skills, and psychological counseling. They were also set up with a visitation program. 
Over the first six months of the plan, they went from an hour of supervised visits with Bradley every two weeks at the local HRS office to unsupervised visits over three hours at a time in Cheryl and Tom's home. Eventually, they were allowed to keep Bradley for weekend visits, from which he would return to his foster parents quiet and withdrawn. Pam Kirkland even noticed bruises on Bradley and reported them to social workers to no avail. The Kirklands wrote a letter to the judge, begging her not to return Bradley to Cheryl and Tom. In the letter, they detailed the following concerns. Bradley was frantic when he returned to their home after his visits with Cheryl and Tom, often crying for extended periods. He also panicked when Jim and Pam left the room. They said Brad once returned from one of these visits with suspicious abrasions on his fingers and swelling and redness of his inner ear. They claimed that HRS caseworker Shirley Dubois saw these injuries. The Kirklands said the Coes lived in a filthy home where Pam Kirkland once caught lice. On the screened-in porch, flies swarmed over garbage, and glass bottles partially filled with moldy Coca-Cola sat on the edge of a table where a child could easily reach them. The final point in the letter was that the Coes had already abandoned Bradley once. They already had an infant daughter, and Cheryl was pregnant with yet another. The Kirklands wrote, Will Bradley become the target child as an outlet for stress? Shelter mother Kip Lyles also voiced her opinion to Bradley's reunification with his mother and stepfather, but no one listened to her. Even the social worker Ms. Barber noted that Bradley was doing well in his foster home and was having a hard time separating from his foster mother, saying, Bradley has had a very rough time as he clings to his foster mother and cries loudly when she leaves the room. On May 23, 1989, Ms. Barber made the recommendation to Circuit Judge Carolyn Fulmer that she return Bradley to his mother and stepfather's care. Judge Fulmer apparently never saw the couple's psychological assessment from the previous year, calling them immature and explosive, although Ms. Barber later claimed that in her report to the judge, she noted that the couple's psychological evaluation was on file. She also claimed that the judge never inquired about the report or requested to review it. Despite the Coe's failure to comply with the terms of their performance agreement, Judge Fulmer ordered Bradley to be returned to Cheryl and Thomas, also ordering Ms. Barber and a mental health worker to visit the home regularly to ensure Bradley's safety. The following day, Pam and Jim Kirkland had to say goodbye to the little boy they had hoped to adopt. It was at 6 p.m. on May 24, 1989, that a state social worker took Bradley from the Kirklands' home. Pam later told an Orlando Sentinel reporter, Brad knew something was happening. He was scared. He was screaming. He didn't want to go. His bottom lip was tucked in, and his eyes were full of tears. The Kirklands never saw Bradley alive again. I'll pause here for a word from my sponsors. In June of 1989, according to Tom's mother, Mary Ray Coe, Cheryl complained that she was having trouble potty training Bradley, saying she punished him for having accidents by putting his underpants on his head and rubbing the mess in his face. Upset about this, Mary's fiancé, a drugstore manager named Joe Anders, claimed he called the HRS child abuse hotline. HRS spokesman Steve Kanicki later said the agency had no record of a hotline phone call about Bradley in June. On July 3rd, the state child abuse hotline received a report that Bradley was sleeping in a bed that was soaked with urine. The caller, a family friend named Teresa Jacobs, who had known the Coes since Bradley was four weeks old, also reported that when Bradley soiled his pants, Cheryl rubbed feces in the baby's face and made him eat it. Teresa told Ms. Barber that she saw a lot of things she didn't like and that she thought Bradley's life was in danger, but she later said Ms. Barber seemed unimpressed. Teresa described Bradley with his shoulders slumped, his demeanor withdrawn and inactive. On July 4th, Bradley spent the day at his grandma Mary's. During that visit, Mary found more than 30 bruises on the baby's arms, legs, back, buttocks, and genitals. When Mary asked what happened, Cheryl told her that Bradley was clumsy and fell on his toys, and that the toilet lid fell on his private parts. That day, Mary took Brad over to her friend Reba Woodard's house. Reba remembered Mary asking, Do these look like normal bruises? I said no. When he left his foster home, he was your normal two-year-old, happy and talkative. That day, he was real lethargic. 
It wasn't the same little child. That evening, Mary said, as she prepared to take Bradley back to Cheryl and Tom, the baby pleaded with her. Brad, stay grandma's. Mary's fiancé, Joe, called the hotline again. Once again, the HRS spokesman said the agency only received a single call to its hotline, and that was on July 3rd, which would have been Teresa Jacobs' call. The allegations made during that call, Mr. Kunicki said, were investigated and deemed unfounded. A day or two after that visit, Mary said, she called the HRS office in Lakeland, where an investigator told her to stop harassing her son's family. Later saying, HRS blew this one royally. Mary told a reporter that she once stopped by her son's mobile home, where Cheryl told her that Bradley was asleep. I'd hear him in his room crying. I'd say, how's Gammy's little boy? And he'd tap on the paneling of the trailer. Mary later lamented not just taking Brad, saying, I wish I'd had more guts. Throughout June and July of 1989, Ms. Barber and a mental health counselor named Judy Brosder visited the Coe home on a regular basis, neither of them reporting any signs of physical abuse. Ms. Brosder noted in a July 21st letter to Judge Fulmer that Brad was adjusting well in the co-home, but also mentioned his lack of bonding with his parents. The couple had missed two mental health appointments, she said, but they had maintained stable housing and been basically cooperative. She mentioned that Tom had been unemployed but had recently obtained a job as a door-to-door newspaper subscription salesman for the ledger. He and Cheryl were not getting along, the counselor wrote, adding that Cheryl, who was due to give birth in August, was experiencing a painful, difficult pregnancy, and that the couple was struggling financially. Right now, the family is at a very stressful time. Despite all of these warning signs, in notes to the judge, both Ms. Broster and Ms. Barber recommended that Brad stay with Cheryl and Tom. On July 25, 1989, during a judicial review of Bradley's case, Judge Fulmer reviewed a social study report Ms. Barber and her supervisor submitted, which recommended continued supervision and visitation on the existing terms. The report also noted problems with the Co's performance agreement, stating that the couple attended two scheduled appointments for psychological counseling, but missed another, and didn't bother to call and cancel it. It also mentioned that the family was under additional stress because Cheryl was pregnant again, and that they had missed their most recent in-home appointment with their support worker. Judge Fulmer ruled that Bradley would stay with Cheryl and Tom, ordering continued supervision and visitation on the existing terms, per their recommendation. Just two days later, at 1 p.m. on July 27, 1989, a neighbor called the local sheriff's office, saying a little boy was unconscious and to please hurry. Rescue workers rushed to the co-home, where they found Bradley bruised and not breathing. At Lakeland Regional Medical Center, Due to massive brain damage, medical staff determined that Bradley could not survive his injuries. On July 28th, just two months after being placed in his mother and stepfather's custody, Bradley was taken off life support and pronounced dead. The following day, 22-year-old Thomas Coe and 20-year-old Cheryl Coe, who was about seven months along in her current pregnancy, were arrested, both charged with first-degree murder and child abuse. Their infant daughter, Becky, was taken into protective custody. The story this couple told police was unthinkable. They said they were having a hard time potty training Bradley, so when he had an accident, they forced him to lie in it or rubbed his face in it. Sometimes, they would make him stand in a corner with one hand on top of his head and the other holding his genitals. On the day of his fatal injury, Tom and Cheryl said, Bradley poo-pooed in his pants, so Cheryl hosed him off in the yard. They then brought him inside, where Tom held Bradley by the ankles and dunked his head repeatedly in the toilet, although he didn't remember how many times he did this. Detective Paul Shale III described the method of dunking as plunger style. Next, they threw Bradley into the tub with force and gave him a freezing cold shower. Then Brad stumbled into the living room with Thomas and Cheryl prodding him along where they beat him in the head with couch pillows over and over and over, until the tiny boy stood up, stiff as a board, fell over backward, and curled up into the fetal position, spasming out. There are no words to describe how horrific this mental picture is. According to police, Bradley's brain was injured while Tom dunked him repeatedly into the toilet, hitting his head on the porcelain and causing the hemorrhage that would later kill him. Cheryl stood by and smoked a cigarette as she watched, doing nothing to intervene or stop the abuse. 
Associate Medical Examiner Alexander Melamud, who performed Bradley's autopsy on July 29th, recorded over 60 bruises in various stages of healing on the little boy's body and another 32 on his head, as well as small abrasions on his fingertips and the backs of his hands. Bradley, who was only 2 feet 8 inches tall and weighed 24 pounds, had also suffered extensive internal hemorrhaging. Dr. Melamud wrote in his report, The child died of head trauma. Shelter home mother Kip Lyles said of the little boy she had for a short time but would love for a lifetime, This baby had never had a finger raised to him, let alone a voice. How terrified he must have been when he went back to Tommy and Cheryl. He had to be so confused and scared and wondered where did the people go who loved him. Bradley's broken-hearted foster parents, the Kirklands, organized a simple funeral service to say goodbye to the little boy they loved. HRS had offered to pay for the funeral, but they refused to take the money. Pam Kirkland said, I don't want HRS having anything to do with Brad anymore. During the service, which took place at 1 p.m. on Thursday, August 3, 1989, at the Parkview Baptist Church, Bradley lay in his tiny white casket, wearing the outfit Pam bought for him, a white shirt, blue bow tie, red jacket, and a baseball cap that read, Little Slugger. Bradley was buried in Oak Hill Burial Park Cemetery in Lakeland, Florida, on August 3, 1989. His headstone featured an inset photo of Bradley, along with the inscription, Bradley Jean McGee, June 6, 1987, to July 28, 1989. Beneath that is inscribed a quote from Rev. Jerry C. Sawyer, who said the same at Bradley's funeral service. Bradley's silent cry is being heard in this county and in this state and in this nation louder than all our voices put together. Both Tom and Cheryl Coe were indicted on their murder and child abuse charges. It soon came out that three employees of the Florida Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services were disciplined regarding Bradley's case. Caseworker Margaret Barber, her supervisor Judy Ross, and HRS Subdistrict Administrator Tom McFadden were all placed on paid leave pending an investigation. Caseworker Shirley Dubois, who saw the injuries on Brad's hands, resigned altogether. An HRS investigation conducted in August revealed that at least 10 people, three of whom, including Margaret Barber, were state workers, had been aware that Bradley may have been abused in the weeks leading up to his death, but many failed to report it. On August 31, 1989, Four HRS workers were indicted by a Polk County grand jury who recommended that the four face criminal charges for failing to report Bradley's ongoing abuse. The following month, Cheryl gave birth to another baby girl in jail. She was taken away and adopted. It was obvious that something had to be done about Florida's child welfare system. Bradley's death put an angelic face to the specter of child abuse in the state and set a fire under Florida's citizens who were outraged and demanded change. Doris Ashley, a stay-at-home mom from Winter Haven, started a petition drive to prompt then-Governor Bob Martinez to overhaul HRS. James T. Russell, the state attorney for both Pinellas and Pasco counties, began calling for laws that would change the state's priorities from automatic reunification to, how about this, protecting children. What a concept. Outside the HRS office in Tampa, protesters picketed, and over 100 people gathered for a candlelight vigil in Bradley's memory. Multiple groups, including the Florida Foster Parents Association and Victims of Child Abuse Laws, planned a caravan from Miami to Tallahassee in September in Bradley's name. They planned to present Governor Martinez with a petition containing thousands of signatures from citizens demanding change. In November, foster mother Pam Kirkland told an Orlando Sentinel reporter, The system is wrong. The system is at fault. It's overloaded. It's failing. It's in crisis. It's ready to topple. The agency was created to protect the children, and it's not able to do that. Lawmakers pointed to a turnover rate among child welfare workers of up to 60% a year in some HRS districts, paltry salaries for even veteran caseworkers, and overworked caseworkers handling over 50 cases per month in some cases. Then-Governor Bob Martinez and other legislators made plans to hire hundreds of additional caseworkers, improve training programs to help investigators detect child abuse, and consider raising salaries for HRS employees. These plans could cost anywhere from 12 to over $93 million per year. 
However, state economists told Governor Martinez and other legislators that the money simply wasn't available due to low sales tax and other revenue, which created a deficit of over $280 million and forced the state to cut funding to education and other children's programs. Even though most of their attention would be on transportation issues during the November special session of the state legislature, Senate President Bob Crawford said of the child abuse issue, I still hope we can do something. I remain confident we will. Representative Mike Abrams said, You can pump a lot more money into HRS, but I don't know how prudent that will be right now. I think both the House and Senate agree we've got to take a serious look at salaries, but it'll take more time. Pam Kirkland's response was, The question is, can we afford not to find the money? We can spend millions on the Florida panther. Maybe we could find the money if we listed children as an endangered species. Pam, who kept a photo of sweet little Bradley on her dresser, said she planned to lobby lawmakers in Tallahassee for more money because she felt she owed it to Bradley. I have this great big, sick feeling in my stomach that won't go away. When I look at Brad's picture, I see his eyes saying, Mommy, what are you doing for kids like me? I just can't let him down. An Orlando Sentinel article posited the question about the public outrage. But will their anger burn as brightly when the stories of Bradley's gruesome death no longer lead the nightly news? Can the public fury be sustained during the lengthy process of changing laws and tightening bureaucracies? The article quoted Dick Batchelor, a former state senator who had become known as an advocate for children's issues, as saying, Unfortunately, the public is very fickle. These heinous cases seem to refocus the public on the issue, but then it will die down. He said that child abuse cases that made the headlines were often forgotten as the initial shock wore off and the cases wound their way through the legal system. The article mentioned a number of such cases, only one of which I've even heard of, and I have a list of hundreds of children. This very thing, the propensity of the public to forget about a child after the novelty of the case and its horrific headlines wear off, is exactly why I insist on providing updates on the cases I cover. You may have seen last week that I posted an Apple Podcasts review on Facebook that was complaining about my update episodes. This mouth breather had the actual audacity to write, I used to love this podcast. It's opened my eyes to the severe child abuse that goes on. Lately, though, it's all recaps or going back over old cases she's already done. While I'm glad there are no new cases to tell, I think you have to know when to stop. I'm taking it off my list of favorites. First of all, um, good, take me off your list of favorites. You are clearly not the intended audience for this podcast. As I said in my subsequent Facebook rant, and as I frequently say on the show, I will never run out of stories to cover when in the U.S. alone, four to seven children die from child abuse every single day. I could release an episode every day for the rest of my life and never run out of new cases to tell. I'm not one of the true crime podcasters who tells a story because it's popular in the sensationalist news headlines or because I know that telling the gory details will draw listeners. I'm not going to tell a child's story and then forget about it. I'm not here to cash in by attracting people with horrific headlines and then abandoning the stories for the next awful case. As I said on Facebook, these are real children with real families, and these kids matter to me as human beings. Every last one of them has a piece of my heart. I've always been, even before I started the blog and then the podcast, and always will be, 100% invested in following each and every child's story through to the end of the legal case. I have probably hundreds of Google alerts set up, not to mention Vine link notifications, calendar reminders, and countless other ways to stay up to date on every case I've ever covered or even followed. Beyond tracking the legal cases, I stay in touch with many of these families even after the court proceedings are over and done with. I've made some irreplaceable friends and connections through doing this work, and they all mean the world to me. As I said in my post, if you're here just for the gruesome stories and don't care about updates, developments, resolution, or closure, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. I am always going to follow these stories and provide updates as I get them, and I am never going to stop pounding it into ignorant people's heads that these are not just news stories to clutch your pearls over. These are real people. These kids' lives mattered, and their deaths cannot be in vain. Finding these quotes in an article as I researched this week's episode really struck a nerve after I posted that Facebook rant just a couple days before, as you can probably tell by my continued rant here. 
This is why I'm so inspired and amazed by people like Gina Hullett, the foster mom of four-year-old Judah Morgan, Janice Riston, eight-year-old Ray Lee Browning's mom, Tammy Risen, grandma of four-year-old Avery Lee Hobbs, Ashley Barnes, three-year-old Hazel Homan's aunt, and Sharonda Orridge, aunt of 11-year-old Heaven Watkins, among many, many other family members who have sought real, actionable changes in the systems that failed these children. They didn't have a knee-jerk reaction to an awful news story, demand change, and then forget about it. They've never given up, even long after the headlines died down, because those headlines represent the worst moments of their lives. These badass warrior women and many others have dedicated themselves to making necessary changes in honor of the children they lost to protect other children who do not have to die. We owe it to these kids never to forget their names and faces. In Bradley's case, unusually, momentum continued to build. Jack Levine, the executive director of the Florida Center for Children and Youth, said Bradley's death could be a watershed moment in regard to the politics of children's services. Things are happening out there. I have been astounded by the interest of parents out there. They are getting activated based on the McGee case as never before. In fact, as a result of Bradley's death during that special legislative session in November of 1989, Florida legislators passed the Bradley-McGee Act, which allocated $48 million to the state's child protection system to hire 628 new child welfare workers. Not long afterward, during the regular legislative session, another 93 positions were added. To this day, many child welfare advocates, many of whom chose their career path after the outrage and trauma that resulted from Bradley's murder, consider Bradley's death the catalyst that led to many improvements to Florida's child protection system. They say Bradley was the child who caused Florida's child welfare priorities to shift and officials to realize that the child's safety was more important than family reunification. Now, I'll take another quick sponsor break. In March of 1990, it was announced that 21-year-old Cheryl McGee Coe had accepted a plea deal, pleading guilty to a reduced charge of second-degree murder and aggravated child abuse. According to Assistant State Attorney John Aguero, the plea agreement did not stipulate that Cheryl would testify against Tom at his trial. However, he did say she would be subpoenaed to testify after Tom's trial began in July of that year. Despite the plea agreement they gave Cheryl, prosecutors refused to offer such a deal to Tom. Mr. Aguero, the lead prosecutor on Bradley's case, said of Tom, He didn't do the same thing Cheryl did, adding that Tom was welcome to plead guilty to first-degree murder and roll the dice on whether or not the judge would sentence him to death. Tom's public defender, Deborah Goins, said, That's not a plea bargain. We are not willing to go into court and plead guilty to first-degree murder. Our contention is he is not guilty of first-degree murder. She believed there was more at play than mere justice. You know as well as I do that this is a very political case. John Peck, a spokesman for Governor Martinez, did not agree with that contention, saying, The governor does not get involved in these decisions. That's why state attorneys are elected. Prosecutor Aguero said, I have never had any kind of consideration given to anything other than the strength or weakness of the prosecution. State Attorney Jerry Hill, Mr. Aguero's boss, said, I hear those kinds of asinine allegations made day in and day out that it's political. I'll leave those kinds of statements to someone else. It's a murder case. The biggest question when it came to Tom's culpability in Bradley's death was intent. Was his and Cheryl's treatment of Bradley punishment or abuse? As far as the prosecution was concerned, it didn't matter. Based on Florida law, when someone died during the commission of another crime, in this case aggravated child abuse, that was enough to convict them of first-degree murder. It didn't matter whether Tom intended to kill Bradley or simply abuse him. According to the law, if the jury found that Tom willfully tortured or maliciously punished his stepson, he could be found guilty of felony murder. Tom's defense, however, was that he did not intend to abuse or kill Bradley. His actions, he insisted, were only intended as punishment. HRS spokesman Steve Kanicki told the Tampa Bay Times, A case like this does give notice that, regardless of if you believe, spare the rod and spoil the child, there is a point beyond which you may not go in disciplining that child. 
Yeah, I'd say slamming the child's head into the toilet and beating him to death with a pillow is a pretty clear line not to cross. On April 20th, 1990, Cheryl was sentenced to 30 years in prison for murder and 15 years for child abuse, which I believe were ordered to be served concurrently. Shelter home mother Kip Lyles told the Greensboro News and Record, I don't think it was harsh enough. I think she should have received the death penalty for what she did. She did nothing to protect the child, and she participated in it. In June of 1990, 62-year-old Margaret Barber, who still worked for HRS but with the elderly instead of children, faced trial for her charges relating to Bradley's death. Ms. Barber was the first HRS caseworker ever to be charged with a felony for the way she handled her official duties. She was accused of failing to tell a juvenile court judge about the 18-month-old report detailing the co's explosive personalities and lack of parenting ability, and she was also accused of failing to report an allegation that Cheryl was forcing Bradley to eat feces. Foster mom Pam Kirkland testified at Ms. Barber's trial, telling the court that Bradley had significant problems after he began having visitation with Cheryl and Tom. She said he would cry for no normal reason and whenever she or her husband, Jim, would leave the room, Bradley would be panic-stricken, especially if he was left alone in the bathroom. Pam testified that she learned during this time that Tom was unemployed and that the couple had moved without the court's authorization. She also said that after Bradley was removed from her home, Margaret Barber refused to allow her to see the baby again. During her testimony, Ms. Barber said she didn't report the allegation that Cheryl was putting feces in Bradley's mouth because the same allegation had been made two days prior, and that case was already closed as unfounded. She said she had a caseload at the time of about 60 foster children and did her job as well as she could. I'm not perfect. There may have been some things I missed. Under cross-examination, she admitted that she had concerns about the Co's lack of progress in completing the requirements of the performance agreement, but that she recommended to the judge in May of 1989 that Bradley should be returned to them anyway. She explained this by saying that she thought, based on numerous visits with the couple, that they had made a good deal of progress despite not completing counseling or parenting classes or maintaining steady employment. I felt they had come a long way from where they were. There was always the effort to try and reunite the family. That was the mandate of my office. When she was asked why she did not give the psychological report to the judge, she said it was another caseworker's responsibility, adding that she mentioned the report in at least three letters to the judge between December of 1988 and May of 1989, and that the judge could have looked it up herself. The judge in question, Circuit Judge Carolyn Fulmer, testified by deposition that the psychological report was never made available to her. Outside the courtroom, defense attorney John Liguori said, The judge was aware of the psychological report and was free to look at it any time, but she did absolutely nothing in this case. The judge is the one who should have been indicted here. During his closing arguments, prosecutor John Aguero said, This case is not about what Ms. Barber did. It is about what she did not do. He told the jury that Ms. Barber failed to act on Tom and Cheryl's psychological report and that she also ignored other signs that Bradley's life was in danger. You could have drawn a roadmap from the psychological report and it would have told you every act that they did is perfectly in line with this summary and Ms. Barber disregarded it. Defense attorney Liguori said the prosecutor's argument was hindsight. The state now asks you to Monday morning quarterback the decision of Ms. Barber. A jury of six members deliberated for an hour and a half before finding Ms. Barber guilty of felony child abuse and a misdemeanor charge of failing to report suspected abuse. The courtroom went silent as the verdicts were read, and Ms. Barber had no reaction, nor any comment afterward. Although Ms. Barber faced up to five years in prison, she was ultimately sentenced to three years probation. She was the only one of the four HRS employees charged who was convicted. Prior to her trial, two others were acquitted, and the charges against a third were dropped. Thomas Coe's two-week trial took place in July of 1990 in Fort Myers, which is in Lee County because it was impossible to find an impartial jury in Polk County. For his crimes, he could face the state of Florida's most barbaric punishment, the electric chair. His stepmother, Jody Coe, told a reporter of the first-degree murder charge, His attorneys are hoping they can get it dropped to second or third degree by the time testimony is finished. 
Jody also said that her stepson, Tom, who had recently requested a haircut prior to his trial, was in high spirits, although she hadn't discussed the case with him. He hasn't been getting depressed. He's learning to take it one day at a time. That's about all you can do. As to whether Tom deserved the death penalty, Bradley's foster mom, Pam Kirkland, told a reporter, Could Bradley McGee defend himself? No. Thomas Coe was an adult. To let him off is sending a message to all other parents. Go ahead and beat your children. If all of these things are true that he supposedly did, then he deserves to die. Tom's trial began on Tuesday, July 17, 1990, after a week of jury selection. Assistant State Attorney Bill Jennings gave the prosecution's opening statement, saying that Tom held his stepson by the ankles, plunged Bradley's head repeatedly into the toilet, and flushed it. He warned jurors that the facts of the case would be unpleasant, but they will show that that man right there tortured Bradley McGee, and when all the evidence is in, there will be no doubt in your minds that that man right there is guilty of aggravated child abuse and murder in the first degree. The defense painted the picture in less harsh colors during its opening statement. Defense attorney Robert Norgard admitted that his client dunked Bradley headfirst into the toilet, but he claimed the action was punishment. Norgard mentioned other unusual forms of punishment the couple used, one of which was intended to deal with Bradley's perfectly natural curiosity about his own body. They were having a problem with Bradley playing with himself. He said they thought it was morally wrong and evil, so they would flick the area where he was playing with himself, not intending to harm him. On day one, the jury saw color 8 by 10 photos of Bradley on life support in the hospital. His fine blonde hair was covered with white gauze his blue eyes closed. A bruise adorned his left cheek, and a tube was attached to his mouth. Although he looked eerily peaceful in those photos, other photos of Bradley's injuries gave jurors some idea of the hell he endured in Cheryl and Tom's care. Those pictures, which jurors passed slowly and silently amongst themselves, showed bruises and scars on Bradley's little bottom. One photo showed over a dozen bruises, including dark circles below his buttocks and a bright red scratch on his lower back. When the jurors finished looking at the photos, none of them could bring themselves to look at the defendant. Tom himself held a hand to his face and turned away from the photos, the impact of which public defender Norgard had earlier tried to mitigate by suggesting the bruises were caused by spanking, saying, What you're going to find out is that the bruises are superficial. Witnesses testified that Cheryl Coe punished Bradley for potty training accidents by forcing him to eat feces. Neighbor Angela Straith, who lived five mobile homes down from the Coes, said Cheryl was frantic as paramedics prepared to take Bradley to the hospital. Angela offered to watch baby Rebecca, and eventually Cheryl brought her a bottle and some diapers. The milk in the bottle had gone bad, and Becky was wearing a soiled diaper and had dried egg in her hair. Tom's younger sister, Tanya Sue Ko, had previously told a reporter of her brother, I hope he fries. He lost the right to be my brother when he killed that little boy. Tanya testified that Cheryl and Tom forced Bradley to sleep in a soiled bed. She didn't look at her brother as she testified that she saw feces in Bradley's bed about four weeks before he died, saying it smelled really bad. Some of it was old, she said, some new, and some smeared across the bed. Tanya described Bradley as a happy-go-lucky boy who, in her brother and sister-in-law's care, became lethargic and was covered in bruises on his arms, legs, back, and genital area. She told the jury that she wanted to call HRS to report the abuse, but her mother, Mary Ray Coe Anders, wouldn't allow her to make the call. I'll pause here for one last sponsor break. Cheryl Coe was called to testify against her husband on July 24, 1990. Before she spoke on the stand, Circuit Judge Randall McDonald told spectators in the gallery, If you don't think you can handle it, I suggest you get up and walk out now. Upon the witness stand, Cheryl, wearing a blue prison outfit and jail-issue thong sandals, reportedly choked back tears as she spoke. In a soft voice, Cheryl told the jury her account of the abuse she said Tom executed against Bradley, much of which, she said, centered around potty training. She described several incidents in which Tom punished Bradley by putting him inside the toilet bowl. 
After one potty accident, she said, Tom forced Bradley to pick up feces with his mouth and put it in the toilet. She said Tom also took umbrage at another problem Bradley had, which is that he was curious about his body and sometimes touched his genitals. For the record, this is absolutely normal behavior for a toddler and totally innocent, just like babies are curious about their fingers and toes. The behavior often starts around the same time as potty training, because the child has easier access to that area without a diaper in the way, and it can also be a self-soothing behavior caused by stress, which it sounds like Bradley experienced constantly in that house. Tom, Cheryl said, had a few different ways to deal with Bradley's self-touching behavior. Sometimes, he would use his hand or feet to put pressure on the baby's private area. Other times, he would put cayenne pepper and alcohol on Bradley's genitals. Finally, he would force Bradley to stand with his hands on his head, and if his hands dropped, Tom put them back up and hit him on the head with his fist. Tom had also, Cheryl testified, urinated on Bradley. During Cheryl's testimony, Prosecutor Aguero directed her to step down from the witness stand, handing her a 33-inch doll and directing her to hold it by the ankles to demonstrate for the jury how Tom dunked her son's head in the toilet. In tears, Cheryl held the doll over a toilet that had been brought into the courtroom, moving the doll up and down so its head went in and out of the toilet bowl. She told the jury, like that. On the day of Bradley's fatal injury, Cheryl testified, Tom had a job interview at a convenience store, and the whole family went along for the ride, including Cheryl, Bradley, and baby Becky. Tom was already angry prior to the job interview because he didn't have a clean shirt to wear. On the way home from the interview, Cheryl said, Brad made a mess in his pants. Tom didn't like it because he didn't like the smell in the car. When they got home, Cheryl said, Tom told her to take off his clothes and hose him down. After that, she said, Tom took him back in the bathroom and dunked his head several times by the ankles. She said she saw Tom doing this as she walked past the bathroom to get a cigarette, and she heard a clank as her son's head smashed into the porcelain. She also testified to smoking that cigarette and watching while Tom continued dunking her baby in the toilet. Then, Cheryl said, Tom threw Bradley into the bathtub and sprayed him with cold water, after which he makes him walk to the front room, and Brad was having a hard time because his legs were weak and tucked in, and every once in a while he'd fall. When he gets into the living room, Tom starts hitting him with a pillow. Prosecutor Aguero held up a sofa pillow, asking Cheryl if she recognized it, which she did. When asked how Tom hit Bradley with it, Cheryl said, Up over his head. He hit Brad real hard. When Mr. Aguero showed her another pillow, she said she recognized it, too, as the pillow she used to hit Bradley. But only once, she said, as opposed to Tom, who hit Bradley multiple times until the baby collapsed, like in an epileptic fit. Tom, she said, tried to revive Bradley, first with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, then by holding alcohol and Clorox bleach under his nose. According to doctors, however, it was already too late by that time. Bradley would have been brain dead almost instantly. When Cheryl was asked about how she punished Bradley, she said they once forced her son to stand by her bed all night while she and Tom slept. She admitted that once she braised a fork with feces on it across her son's mouth. She also said she spanked him, hit him on the head, I shook him. She said that when she shook Bradley, it was early July, and she was afraid she might lose control of her temper. I tried to talk to Tom about it because I was afraid I would hurt him or kill him. He didn't know what to say, so he called his mother. After Cheryl talked to Tom's mom, Mary, Cheryl made the decision that Tom would be the one to discipline Bradley. Prosecutors did not ask her why she didn't bother to intervene when Tom inflicted his final punishment. But Tom's defense attorney, Norgard, asked Cheryl why, if she was completely innocent, she accepted a deal to plead guilty to second-degree murder. Cheryl claimed she was afraid she wouldn't get a fair trial because of all the publicity the case had received. There was this brief exchange between Mr. Norgard and Cheryl. Do you feel hurt? Yes. Anger? Yes. Hatred towards Tom? Yes. When Mr. Norgard asked Cheryl if she had lost all of her possessions because of Tom, she replied, Possessions ain't nothing to me. It's my kids. While she was in the courtroom, Tom refused to meet Cheryl's eyes, although she apparently tried to make eye contact with him and even paused her testimony at one point to glare at him. Cheryl's testimony was, for obvious reasons, the most damning in the case by far. 
After she stepped down from the stand, prosecutors read the transcripts of Cheryl's statements to police. They also played recordings of Tom's police statements, one of which was a flat-out confession, in which he said, Brad had pooped in his diaper. I took him back to the bathroom, got irate, then I turned him upside down and dunked him into the toilet. I don't know how many times I did it, everything was happening so fast. Then I flushed the toilet for the noise of it to scare him. On the tape, Polk County Sheriff's Detective Paul Shale asked Tom how he felt. Tom said, Upset. Sorry that I did it. I didn't mean to do it. I was upset. It was a bad day all around. At that point, the prosecution rested its case. As I said at the beginning, I was amazed at the sheer volume of detail I was able to find about Bradley's story online even though it took place over 30 years ago. Because there is so much, I'm going to end the episode here and pick up where I left off in Part 2. That's it for this week. Join me next time for Part 2 of Bradley's Story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com. You can support the show by visiting patreon.com slash stlcpod, where you can become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. You can also support the show at ko-fi.com slash stlcpod. Follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on TikTok at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dreamnote Music, and all music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. And remember, if you see something, say something.